better. So I hope that you guys enjoyed staying warm by the comforting, familiar hearth of the Friday the 13th franchise in our back-to-back uh, season opening episodes because we're about to trek out into a snow-whipped wilderness of silent <laughs> Scandinavian horror films. I'm Dylan, drinking a really delicious black lager from La Mouche in Natashkwan, awesome brewery. And Wilhelm is with us here to talk Swedish movies. Yeah. Hey, William. Hello. I did not open a beer. I was enjoying a, an Austrian red wine. Uh, Sheldon's going to be sitting this one out. And instead, it's the hour of the wolf. Nick Wolf is back with us to talk Swedish movies. Uh, you might remember Hi. Nick from uh, from the Cronenberg episode. Hey, Nick. Hey, thanks for having me back. I'm drinking a nice PBR. Because we've nice. got to keep it a little bit lowbrow. Somebody's got to fill the Sheldon role. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in the role of Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So like I mentioned, we're, we're going into the world of silent films and uh, more specifically Scandinavian silent films. So Swedish and also Danish movies from about uh, 1917 to 1922. That's the niche that we're going to be burrowing into. Um, I did three interviews for this one. But that's what happens when it's six weeks between episodes. <laughs> so we're going to be hearing from Ann Bachman, who's a film professor with Linnaeus University in Sweden. Ooh. And she's going to tell us a little bit more about the history of the Swedish film industry in the silent era. And we're also going to be hearing from Patrick Hagman, who's a theologian in Sweden. And mm. he's going to tell us a little bit about Lutheranism and the role that Lutheranism played in the creation of the modern Scandinavian states which also has a role to play in these films, I think, for sure, eh, with the religious dread that often uh, drips into them. And then later in the evening, we are going to be hearing from Richard Backstrom, who is a professor of anthropology and the humanities at the University of Edinburgh. And he co-authored a fascinating book about Hexan. He's going to help us get even deeper into that movie a little bit later on. Uh, I'm curious, because I haven't asked this yet. Have either of you guys actually been to Sweden or any of the Scandinavian countries? Nope. No, me neither. Sadly, not yet. It's it's certainly on my travel bucket list. Uh, being of Icelandic heritage, I always wanted to go to Scandinavia. Well, we're going to do a sort of travelogue over there. I read that in Stockholm, one of the biggest tourist attractions, is that on the island of Deer Garden in the Stockholm area, there's this gigantic open air museum, which is one of the first of these in the world. And it attracts over a million visitors every year. It's called the Skansen, and it was opened in 1891. Uh, so you go there and there's a replica of like a whole entire rustic 19th century town. You know, people in period costume pretending to be tanners and glass blowers and farmers and stuff. So when the museum opened 130 years ago, a lot of Sweden's population centers were recently connected by railroad. Industry was on the rise, and the children of farmers now had the chance to become modern cosmopolitans in the cities. These were the conditions that gave rise to the Skansen, which was a kind of an attempt to present a celebratory, unifying image of the country by dipping into the well of the past, bringing this fast modernizing world into communion with the villages of farmers deeply bound to their craggy soil and their Lutheran faith, so a few years later, after the turn of the century, there was a thriving film industry that would emerge telling Swedish stories coming from a similar place. And some of these silent images would also reveal some dredged up persistent visions of ghosts and witches and religious fear, definitely mingling with modern anxieties. And that's the subject of this episode. So we're going to get into the history of Swedish silent and Danish film and the proto horror works from 100 years ago. We're being a little big tent with the word horror, as we often are on this show, right? I mean, it's more like four films that have horror elements in them. Absolutely. They precede most genres of film. And so mm -hmm. it's there's elements of so many genres that would follow that then by way of these films, especially when we get to our uh, big finale, a film that introduces elements of multiple genres at the same time that will then reflect and, and inspire them. But horror elements for sure and strong ones strong horror elements yeah i don't know about you guys but silent movies no matter what genre they're in there always seems to be something a little haunting about them that plays well into horror for me and i think maybe part of it is just the fact that 
cinema is still young enough that it still feels kind of weird to watch a movie and know with absolute certainty that everyone you're watching and everybody who made the movie is long since dead. And the images themselves, the way they look with those old equipment, you know, there's a ghostly quality to that too. The, the flickering images, the thick white pancake makeup everybody had to wear. (laughs) The makeup especially hammers in that effect. Like just everyone has these gaunt, sorrowful eyes (laughs) because they can't help but have this pasty, almost death mask placed upon them (laughs) to act through. The combination of the aesthetics, the ancient quality of the film, and the use of some of the techniques they have in these movies, like the double exposure of cars that they start using to bring ghosts to life, has an especially eerie quality to it. For sure. And the almost theater acting, like the big gestures and motions there's just something missing and i guess it could be because they're they're silent films that it almost reaches that uncanny valley area where it's like oh this is very realistic but everybody looks a little weird everybody's acting a little weird and the sound is just not right that just makes everything really eerie Mm -hmm. the different frame rate i think that also contributes to that uncanny feeling like you mentioned of watching things that are somewhat recognizably strikingly human and relatable but also kind of weirdly different and inhuman absolutely and it it touched on a great point there about the sound not being quite right the fact that any sounds that are part of it are so tangential or sitting on top of it or played live in wherever it may be presented depending on how it's being presented but that that distance of image from the sound very much plants it closer to just a literal moving picture. There's not much more life to these than a still image in some ways. And so seeing a still image come to life in sometimes eerie silence, knowing that the music is not connected to it has an uncanny feel. There's no diegetic sound. So you can't feel like it's all part of it. We're just playing along to this strange thing we're watching. And also that every body of silent film is always haunted by loss, too, because we always only have fragments Mm -hmm. of what the silent cinema was. Almost any director's work, any nation's work, you only have a few surviving elements. So we're always missing context. We're always missing clues. We always just have these trace ghosts of this era of cinema, the few that survived. (laughs) (laughs) already off on a spooky note (laughs) gather around the campfire we're going to meet uh four directors and four pretty remarkable directors all four of whom uh have names that i'm sure i'm going to manage to mispronounce in multiple different ways throughout the course of this show i'm just going to admit that i'm a little uneasy about pronouncing scandinavian names i i don't know how to do it you know what i mean like it seems close enough to english but then when i look up like a pronunciation guide on youtube Like I looked up the name Victor Sjöström and discovered that it's supposed to be pronounced like Victor Sjöström. Like I was okay with the J being silent. I expected the J to be silent. When the first S was silent, it unsettled me. And when I try to imitate like the pronunciation guides, it it feels mocking when it comes out of my mouth. I feel like I'm doing like a herpy derpy Muppet voice to make fun of them. So I I don't want to do that. (laughs) So I'm just going to try to as respectfully as possible mispronounce the names very Englishly. That's the best I can do. Uh, (laughs) So with that in mind, the four directors that we're going to be talking about are Moritz Stiller, Victor Sistrom, Carl Theodor Dreyer, a name with a certain weight for uh, cinephiles. And finally, our boy Benjamin Christensen. So let's get into um, maybe a little bit of background on the Swedish silent film industry. So I'm speaking with Professor Anne Bachman, an associate professor with the Department of Film and Literature at Linnaeus University in Sweden. And thank you so much for joining me. Glad to be here. So I was hoping to get a bit of a better handle on the Swedish silent film industry. The, the first thing to remember is that Hollywood dominance is from around 1919 onwards, right? 1919 was a wonderful year for Hollywood, and it really, really established world dominance. Uh, Before that, Europe, in different ways, dominated uh, film production, particularly France, Italy, Germany, but also uh, Denmark, which probably isn't something that many people would, would take a guess at. 
Um, Sweden was never really up there. Sweden wasn't a huge film producing country like Denmark was at around 1910. Uh, films produced in Scandinavia before the war would typically, at least, they would be more on the entertainment side. Producers would often calculate um, in the sense that they would use content that was sensationalist. Um, Danish film in particular was enormously successful with that strategy before the war, with this, uh, the so-called uh, erotic melodrama. Uh, that was a bit sensationalist uh, and did extremely well uh, worldwide. So what happened with Europe around that time, of course, was that World War I took out the film industries. The war had um, quite an effect in Sweden as well, but Sweden wasn't directly in the war. So uh, the biggest effect was that film stock was in very short supply. And that was the case more or less everywhere. So the strategy then uh, for film producing companies uh, that they adopted, that was to make fewer films that were more ambitious instead. So they also made it into a kind of a PR move. So it was good publicity. We're going to make wonderful films, but, but not so many of them. Before that, in Scandinavia, many things were different. It's not that there weren't quality discourses also before that, because they were, but this sort of quality aspect and prestige aspect that just takes on importance. And right about 19... 16, 17, that was talked about so much in Sweden. It's when everything was seen to sort of change, or that's the way that the industry talked about it themselves. But in the PR, in, in, in the discourse, and the way that things were talked about, it was really, really important. So there would be literary adaptations quite a lot. Um, they would often contain like some kind of beautiful scenery, or beautiful nature shots, outdoor shots. So this also meant that this was a one piece in a development where cinema became a form of, of leisure also for the upper classes more clearly in like grand new posh cinema theatres with a, a nice classical orchestra playing for uh, for opening night with the uh, overtures and, and everything. Um, and that wasn't something that happened only in Sweden, but uh, in Sweden it was clearly connected to these films with their opening nights would be in those kinds of theatres. And they would get proper theatre reviews in the newspapers. That never happened before then. So this was all excellent publicity. And it was really influential um, for other countries. Uh, not for quite a number of years yet. Because of the war, these films wouldn't be even exported for, for several years yet. So um, it took them some time. They didn't actually make so much money. It's more like they were successful artistically and successful uh, in how they were talked about also internationally um, French film critics um, talked about them a lot in, in the 20s that made sort of a place in film culture for them where they have stayed so we're talking about movies that were made by the studio called Svenska Biograph Theatern or Svenska Bio as it's thankfully known a little easier to say uh, headed by producer Charles Magnusson, who really built the Swedish film industry into something special under his watch. So Magnusson hired two men who would become his star directors in 1912, Victor Sjöström and Moritz Stiller. And these two guys made 64 films between them in their first five years with the company. Uh, the most notable was Sjöström's Ingeborg Holm. Uh, from 1913, a drama about a single mother losing custody of her children, which actually led to legislative reforms in Sweden because it's a realistic depiction of how the poor were being treated to provoke outrage. Uh, but the Golden Age really got started in 1917 when Seastrom released Terhi Vegan, or A Man There Was. And a lot of these movies were based on stories by the author Selma Lagerlöf. Svenska Bio became Svensk film industry in 1919, and the company still exists today. And they've produced, you know, almost any remarkable Swedish movie you can think of. So some of the elements that made these movies really remarkable was the cinematography was just really good. The two Swedish movies we're going to be talking about first both have cinematography by Julius Jensen, who was really good at shooting outdoors, for one thing. Also, the acting was notable because, like we mentioned, acting tends to be really tuned up in silent films. So for silent films, the acting was considered subtle. Okay, so the first movie we're going to be talking about is one by Moritz Stiller, Sir Arnie's Treasure. Kind of a gothic drama. This is also based on a Selma Lagerlöf story. 
which, uh, like I mentioned, a lot of them were. Selma Legoloff is kind of an interesting woman. She was the first woman to ever win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1909 from the mountainous, lake-dotted, farmland region of Sweden. She wrote kind of lyrical, fable-esque stories, um, was kind of seen as like a quaint, humble old spinster spinning yarns. But her private letters reveal that she might have actually been in a romantic triangle with two other prominent female writers. And uh, this is kind of a fable story, right? It's in the 16th century about some Scottish mercenaries loose in a village who commit a horrible act. And then one of them disguised as Sir Archie has a romance with the sister of a girl he killed. And then what makes it a proto-horror movie is that in the last act, it prominently features a ghost brought to life by double exposure. Really precise use of double exposure to have um, just enough of her present and to have her be able to follow characters and characters follow her in a way that seems kind of creepily realistic. And um, the landscapes fucking rule. Yeah, there's some absolutely outstanding shots, especially like the scenes involving the ship and uh, the early one with the sleigh that uh, gets submerged are quite spectacular. The action was really well shot, too. Those like wind lashed, craggy, rocky outcroppings and humps of snow everywhere, iced over fjords. They just seem like they're made to be shot this way. Something about those stark flickering images it seems to really capture what's so severe and unsparing about that kind of harsh winter environment. And and the harsh winter environment is kind of paired with God in the movie too, right? It's strongly implied that God is forcing everybody to stay iced in in this town until they right the wrong that has been committed, right? That's why the ship can't leave because as the captain relates in his story, God is keeping everybody there. So this incredibly well-realized stark weather is like the force of God, which is just punishing everybody for sucking at their job, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) That's interesting because our three Scottish mercenaries here, they also blame their actions on the weather and the harshness of their environment. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, well, we were out of our minds. We were starving and freezing. I find that an interesting dichotomy, having these two, like, the would-be cause and solution to the same problem being their environment, which I guess is often the case in real life. Yeah, it's interesting that God is associated with this punishing force who's not really fixing anything himself. He's just making things really bad for people until I guess they figure out some way to fix things. You know, whatever sense of morality is in here almost seems to come more from the ghost. She's leading people to do the right things. It's like this connection between the living and the dead is the force of morality. It's not coming from the punishing snowy God. It's coming from this, this connection of between the living and dead. The real sin was not, you know, burning the house. It was not stealing the treasure. It was killing somebody and severing that connection. And, you know, I love the final shot of the movie, which is just open water at last. Finally, they've been released. You know, this like gasp of release of seeing the open ocean, of seeing freedom, of being able to be outside and be mobile and go somewhere and not just be punished by these severe conditions all the time. But then when you think about that being like the absence of God is like, God, there's freedom at last. It it doesn't look very good for God from that angle. It does seem like it ends with a bit of like divine intervention of, you know, winter is clenching them down until justice is served. And with that, then yes, they will part the ice like a, you know, like a Scandinavian Moses so that they are free to leave. But it's not like so much divine intervention as it is just a divine retreat. It's mm-hmm. like, thank God, God has yeah. taken a step back. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And of course, there's the dichotomy between interiors and exteriors. Interiors are orange and exteriors are blue. Since this movie, like most of these movies, is not truly a black and white movie. The, the frames are tinted. But also, I, I noticed that in the interiors, there seems to be kind of a centrifugal force where characters are often moving towards the middle of the frame to emphasize the way that they're cloistered in. And when they're in outside in the blue with snow and wind whipping everywhere, they're often moving towards the outside of the frame to emphasize how large and endless the outside space is, even though it is punishing and you can't really go anywhere. You can move without getting anywhere. The 
sense of what it's like to be outside on a harsh winter's day is just always, always present in every shot. And that's pretty impressive to me. Mm -hmm. It's also the first movie that used handwritten title cards by Elva Linden, who did a lot of really good title cards for a lot of these Swedish movies, especially the Stiller movies. And her work on the next Stiller movie after this one, Eroticon, was fucking good. Uh, Let me tell you a little bit about the life of Moritz Stiller, because he's had an interesting life. Moritz Stiller was born a Finnish Jew in 1883, when Finland was part of the Russian Empire still. Uh, His father died when he was a baby, and his mother committed suicide when he was four. And while he was being raised by various family friends, he began acting for the theater in Helsinki. At a young age, he was drafted into the army of Tsar Nicholas II and fled to Sweden rather than serve and started his new life in exile. So when he got involved in the film industry, he quit acting so that he could focus on directing. And he made both movies like this, Lagerlof adapted snow whipped haunting dramas, but he also made extremely modern ribald comedies like the one I mentioned, uh, Eroticon, which that title sounds like a depressing porn industry meetup in like a convention center in Las Vegas, but it's actually just like a comedy of sophistication and infidelity. It's those kind of comic romps that he made were really inspirational for a lot of filmmakers across the continent, including Ernst Lubitsch and Jean Renoir and Charles Chaplin. The last Swedish movie that Stiller made was Gosta Berling Saga. And one of the roles he cast, a young actress who has named Greta Gustafsson, but he may have given her the screen name that she used, which was Greta Garbo. Mm-hmm. And after this movie, he accepted an offer from Louis B. Mayer to come to Hollywood and make movies for his newly formed studio, Amazon Presents MGM. And uh, the story of he, Ed Garbo, it's been retold in different ways. Uh, you know, some people say that Meyer really wanted Garbo to act for him and that he just asked Stiller to come along as part of the deal. Others say that he really wanted Stiller's talent and just accepted Garbo to come along because Stiller really insisted that he give the kid a chance. But either way, they both came to Hollywood together and it ended up working out really well for one of them. <laughs> Garbo, of course, became the biggest silent film star and Stiller. Well, Stiller was supposed to make a movie with Garbo, uh, but ended up getting fired from it. One thing that's interesting about uh, the story of Louis B. Meyer and Mort Stiller is that Meyer, like Stiller, was also born a poor Jew in the Russian Empire at about around the same time. So they have kind of similar origins. No one, no one knows when or where exactly Louis B. Meyer was born. But it was somewhere in the Russian Empire and somewhere around like 1884, 1885 or something. You know, if you ever read things about old time Hollywood or watch series or movies about old time Hollywood like Mank or whatever, you know, you've probably seen depictions of Meyer as an absolute tyrant, the most powerful man in Hollywood. Mm. Uh, he would, did not grow up in Europe like Stiller did. He actually grew up in Canada in uh, St. John, New Brunswick in a poor immigrant family that he was working to support by age 12. Uh, Meyer got into show business when he bought a burlesque house in Massachusetts that catered to Italian immigrants known as the Garlic Box. And then uh, when he moved to Los Angeles and teamed up with Irving Thalberg, you know, it was just a few years before he became the most powerful producer in town. And part of his strategy was going to Europe and poaching talent there. Back to Stiller anyways, he clashed with Meyer, didn't go well. Uh, he did make a couple pictures with him. Uh, Then he signed with Paramount Pictures. Didn't go great with Paramount Pictures either. So he returned to Sweden alone in 1927. In the following year, he died at age 45. And they say that he died from a broken heart. Not the doctors. The doctors say he died from pleurisy. But the the romantic, they... Well, that's the clinical term for it, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, probably. I don't know what pleurisy means. uh, Weirdly, even though Stiller did not exactly make a huge splash in Hollywood, he was giving a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960 Hmm. and both his first and last names were misspelled (laughs) (laughs) yeah appropriate yeah when you see a star that says joe piscopo you know who it's for (laughs) arguably his comedies were more influential than his dramas but he made damn good dramas too and uh sarani's treasure is a movie that i really enjoyed getting into honestly the premonition scene for me was the absolute winner me here. too. Yeah, that was a great it was scene. So scary. It had great tension. Can't you hear them sharpening their knives? Yeah. Jeez, lady, I'm scared now. 
Yeah, and it was a very jarring, sudden amount of suspense, even though as the audience, we were privy to the fact that something bad was probably coming. But then just mm-hmm. seeing one person alone knowing and how helplessly they had to be in this terror. And I love the way it changes the tone of the dinner party, too. Everyone's mm-hmm. kind of like, we're warm, we're inside, we're having a good time. And afterwards, everybody's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Could you stop inviting your wife, please? <laughs> <laughs> she keeps saying ominous things for no reason. <laughs> Why is she talking about the length of their knives so much? It's really <laughs> concerning. Yeah. Like going into it, I watched them in the same order that we're discussing them. But for this one, I was going in kind of wondering about how are these going to be horror films? And I was very curious about that. But the horror seemed to be that it's kind of like a home invasion horror. Mm -hmm. The horror isn't necessarily caused by the like supernatural. It's not uh, like a haunting. It's uh, from the, you know, the horrors of mankind. They are the monsters of the film. And it just made me think about kind of the compare and contrast of things like crime dramas or thrillers to horror films. And, you know, what is the difference between them? Because in this one has a lot of elements like that, because it's very much about like a major crime, a murder happens because of it. And they're on the lamb in a way, and they're, they're hidden identities. And there's a lot of things you see in other uh, bits of crime cinema or television. And I guess it might just be down to, is it procedural or is it incidental? Like horror doesn't tend to be very procedural. Like sometimes it'll have a bit of like police procedure or something, but then it's more the horror comes into what's happening to them. Like Clarice investigating Hannibal Lecter. Like there's a lot of horror elements to like what he's done, but it's more, they're talking about it and going through the motions of how to resolve that. Whereas if she was being mutilated and chased by him, then it's more a horror film. So I thought that's something to kind of keep in mind. Like, are they kind of laying the groundwork of differentiating? Can you call it a thriller or can you call it horror? Is it a gray area? Can there be a contrast? Does the supernatural have to decide that factor or something outrageous have to decide that or the level of violence? I just sort of wondered those things aloud as I am now. So that was something that kind of hit me with this film. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that's what's interesting about watching films from this era, too, because we're watching movies from a time before the cinematic categories were really established. You know, big H horror as a movie category wasn't really a thing yet. Mm -hmm. Um But here we've got a movie that has premonitions, that has ghosts, and also has gothic elements, too. I mean, gothic has a long tradition in literature, but gothic horror movies hadn't really started yet. But you can see this movie as kind of a bridge between gothic literature and gothic horror in a way. And the home invasion thing is interesting because I get that. And especially since this movie does so much great work, as I was talking about, to establish the forbidding punishing nature of being outside and the warmth and cloistered nature of being indoors to have those indoor areas violated by intruders uh, seems to have almost this, you know, elemental, intense, powerful horror attached to it. Okay, so before we get into the next one, um, let me do another little biographical sidebar because I want to tell you guys about the other one of those two great Swedish silent directors I brought up. Victor Seastrom, uh, let's call him. Uh, Victor Seastrom was born in farmland, the same region of Sweden that Selma Lagerlöf was from, that same pastoral setting. In 1879, so he was about five years older than Stiller was, he briefly had an immigrant childhood in Brooklyn because his father attempted to move the family to America, but to return to Sweden after his mother's death. And he too was acting at a very young age in the touring theater companies when he was a teenager. The first time he acted in a movie was in 1912 in a movie directed by Moritz Stiller. Seastrom became a celebrated director himself, and he and Stiller were close friends. Seastrom remained an actor his whole life, uh, even after he stopped directing. In fact, if you're a cinephile, even if you've never seen a movie directed by Victor Seastrom, there's a good chance you've seen him in a movie. He was the lead role of Professor Isaac Borg in Ingmar Bergman's Wild Strawberries. Hmm. Fantastic performance. Absolutely love it. And in fact, the movie that we're about to talk about is the movie that inspired Igmar Bergman to make movies. And he, like Stiller, also accepted an offer from Louis B. Meyer to go make movies in Hollywood after the films we're talking about. Uh, He did so in 1923, so actually a little bit earlier than Stiller did. And it went a little bit better for Seastrom. He made some pretty well-received movies in his time in Hollywood, uh, including 
He Who Gets Slapped with Lon Chaney, <laughs> which I think was the second movie there, which is a fucking fantastic movie. Uh, <laughs> great title. <laughs> and it's a great movie. The character that Lon Chaney plays is <laughs> such a Lon Chaney character. Like he plays a guy who gets so brutally humiliated and cucked in the first act that he decides <laughs> the only thing he has left to do is to reinvent himself as a circus clown, known <laughs> only as He Who Gets Slapped, who appears on stage and gets slapped a bunch. And then becomes a celebrity clown because everybody loves seeing him get humiliated. Um, oh my god! <laughs> amazing. I, I'm starting to think that Joker was a remake of He Who Gets Slapped. <laughs> it, sure. it, it sounds like there's at least there's a lot of groundwork laid. <laughs> um, and he Who Gets Slapped was actually the very first movie produced by MGM, a division of Amazon Studios. Go <laughs> MGM. <laughs> Go and take a risk. <laughs> When talkies came in, though, he was unwilling to adapt to talkies. So that's when he retired from directing and just focused on acting for the rest of his life instead. Okay, so let's get around to the movie itself. The Phantom Carriage, 1921, probably Seastrom's best known movie today. And it really fits very nicely into our proto-horror category. Um, I'll say right off the bat, The Phantom Carriage is among my favorite films. Mm. I have a big obsession with this movie. I really, really like it a lot. A big reason why I like it is just I feel it's got like really great intensity and narrative momentum right from the get go. You start off on somebody's deathbed, you know, and she's like, where's David home? And they're like, we don't want David home to come in. And you're like, who's David home? Yeah. Why exactly? (laughs) And then you're introduced to David home. And then when he starts telling his story, the story is so fucking creepy about how when you die at midnight on New Year's Eve, you have to become this figure who lives for what they perceive as hundreds of years over the next year, picking up corpses. And then you realize as the clock's getting down to midnight, you're like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. Mm -hmm. Somebody going to die. Who's going to die? I find it really intense. It's a really intense movie. Yeah. And when the shrouded figure drawn in a cart by the emaciated horse, again, in haunting double exposure, finally appears, it's a seriously chilling image. Oh, yeah. That the initial like reaping montage especially mm-hmm. like those underwater shots oh yeah that's that's there's those are unforgettable mm-hmm. wonderfully composed bit if that is a short film by itself i would find hypnotic and did find mm-hmm. hypnotic this mysterious figure being able to traverse in a supernatural way anywhere and just yeah the, the wrecked ship and just gathering the dead that was un- uh, unbelievable the tension is pulled so tight it sticks to my mind like just some nightmare that i can't shake and also when david's telling a story i love how he's telling it like he's laughing he's telling it sarcastically it's like you know he's scared about it because it's getting to midnight and he's telling the story but he's trying to exercise his fear by laughing it off and be like hey guys check out this bullshit that that guy said (laughs) but it just doesn't work because then his friends get completely creeped out by it and then yeah, when it becomes a story about his relationship to Edith, the young woman who wanted to rescue him, it's such a sad and brutal relationship that they have. Yeah. It's just so it's unfair so tragic. in its brutality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The tragedy of it is just I couldn't shake. Like, beyond that, like, the ever-grieved wife who's trying to hide from this man and just the suspense of her, like, possible poisoning the ghosts having to watch and and it's just everything about that. Like it's just building up guy. It's not that any kind of ending could have been happy for them in any way because there was just so much tragedy and so many things messed up leading up to it. But Oh, the suspense of that. I I couldn't look away. Mm -hmm. I was so grabbed by it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Even the suspense of like a moment when they first, when Edith and David first meet, when he, he stumbles into her Salvation Army place and after he's woken up in the morning and finds his coat repaired mm-hmm. and he's, he's about to leave and he just kind of stands in the doorway for a little while. And I remember the first time I watched this, I was like, oh shit, what's he going to do? What's he going to fucking do? And then he starts ripping out all the stitching she did and shit. He, he's such a sadistic guy, but mm-hmm. Edith keeps having this need to give him a chance to exercise this power, which is the only power he has is by being an asshole. And it's like the only way he feels he still has a way to express himself is establishing a power over other people by being an asshole. And she needs to keep giving him this chance because she has a need to be humiliated. There's something in her depressive faith that requires this of her. 
his sadism and her masochism match up and it's totally tragic but it doesn't just seem like two broken modern people to me there seems like there's something really ancient and elemental in the way that like her great goodness attracts his great awfulness and the Mm. way his awfulness attracts her great goodness you know they both need the other person to prove something about their essential beliefs about how the world works it's the the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object but in this case it's the irredeemable meeting a redeemer and what can possibly come of that and that scene with the stitches is definitely the to me with the sure stamp of him being like irredeemable yeah it has to explode in tragedy the colliding those of those two such strong forces and strong feelings uh, what did you think about it uh, nick i loved this movie a lot like i thought it was gorgeous mm-hmm. i thought the two strongly contrasting characters it's almost biblical in scope yeah. the way they are opposed man that i almost cried at the end of this movie like i was really moved by victor whose last name i shall not say david holmes <laughs> yeah those last scenes with him begging and everything just i haven't seen a movie that manages to retain tension from start to finish in a way this one did i haven't seen that in years i haven't seen anything like that in a long time it's almost like a parable like a story to teach you something but there's no there's no real lesson like i can't get Mm -hmm. the lesson and i think that's a beautiful thing to have such a strong feeling of a lesson and then almost give you nothing (laughs) Yeah, I love that. It's like brutal Scandinavian nihilism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the message that he wants them to know is let my soul come to maturity before it is reaped. So it's not a message about here's something that should be done. It's more like understand the way things are before you die, maybe. I don't know. Growth. Yeah. There is no like finality of emotional or, or mental growth. Yeah, there's no like final development. We were never going to hit our final forms, but may we have the chance to continue growing up to the point where we we grow no more. Let's always be learning, always assume that we're not quite there, but hope that we come a real long way. And there's there's so many movies that owe so much to this one. Like, I'm sure we all saw The Shining in it. Yeah, yeah. And I just... One of the first notes I made is like, so this is basically the antithesis of It's a Wonderful Life. So instead of like, <laughs> you know, let me show you, like, you know, I'll, I'll get my wings if you see all the great that you do. It's more like, all right, asshole, I'm going to show you what kind of asshole you are <laughs> all night. <laughs> you were so shitty that it remains shitty, even if you're dead right now. You see that? Look at it. Don't look away. Look at it, you fuck. <laughs> That's I kind of got that from it. It's just the... There's no like, oh, I, I want to live again. <laughs> oh, movie house. Like, <laughs> hot dog. None of that coming around. It's just pain. <laughs> uh, if we're ready to move on, I want to tell a little story that I think fits into what we're talking about before we do. Because I read a story about the last time that Victor Siostrom met Moritz Stiller, as written by Siostrom. He wrote a little article about this. And uh, I found it pretty moving. So if you don't mind indulging me a couple of minutes, I wanted to share that. Absolutely. His career was going well in Los Angeles, as I mentioned for Sostrom. You know, he's making fucking bizarre Lon Chaney movies and shit, living the dream. He <laughs> came back to Sweden for the holiday season in 1928. And Moritz Stiller, who, as I mentioned, his attempt at a Hollywood career had basically ended in disgrace, uh, was now very ill in a hospital bed in Stockholm. And when Sjöström found out that his old friend Stiller was ill in a hospital, he started visiting him every day to keep him company, and they would talk for hours. And after one of these visits, uh, just after Sjöström returned home, he received a phone call from Stiller's nurse saying that Stiller wanted to see him again right away because he had something very, very important he needed to tell him. Jesus. Leave suspense to the masters, Dylan. <laughs> that was me taking a drink of water. But... <laughs> I'm now clutching here like, oh, God, what happens to their spirits? <laughs> so I, I'm just going to read exactly for what Sjöström wrote about this. 
I hurried back to the hospital again and was with him for more than an hour waiting eagerly for what he wanted to tell me, but he only talked about indifferent things. Then the nurse finally came in and said she could not allow me to stay any longer. She must ask me to leave. But then Stiller suddenly got desperate. He grabbed my arm in despair and would not let me go. No, no, he cried. I haven't told him what I must tell him. The nurse separated us and pushed me towards the door. I tried to quiet and comfort him, saying that he could tell it to me tomorrow. But he got more and more desperate. His face was wet with tears. And he said, I want to tell you a story for a film. It will be a great film. It's about human beings, and you are the only one who can do it. I was so moved I did not know what to say. Yes, yes, Mohi, was all I could stammer. I will be with you first thing in the morning, and then you will tell me. I left him crying in the arms of the nurse. There was no morning. Next day, he was almost unconscious. He tried to talk, but although I put my ear close to his mouth, I could not make out what he said. And I don't know if he understood what I said. He only kept staring at me. A day or two later, he passed away. There's a little fun, happy story oh. that I wanted to share with you guys and that I wanted to use to wrap up this chapter about Stiller, Sjostrom, and their uh, world... Well, that's depressing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what did you expect when you signed up for this episode? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's suiting. It's quite suiting. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> oh. I can't see colors anymore. So before we get to our even more religious third film, this would probably be a good time to bring in a theologian. So uh, the first thing one has to know is that uh, after the Reformation in the 16th century, uh, the Nordic countries developed a state church, which of course meant that the church became very powerful, but even more, it meant that the state became very powerful. Unlike any state before, the state had an apparatus to kind of control every aspect of the citizens' lives which wasn't something that was possible before that. And I think this has uh, had a profound effect on on the Nordic countries. Yeah, the state kind of encompassed the entire society in the Nordic countries. And, and this was true up to, I, I guess, like the 1980s or something. There was a very strong sense of consensus in, in decision-making. It wasn't usually seen as a good thing to criticize the authorities and so on. And I think this is very much a foundation to the way that the Nordic countries have functioned. So I'm talking with Dr. Patrick Hagman, a theologian. Patrick, thank you so much for agreeing to join me. I'm glad to be here. So how did Lutheranism become installed in the Nordic countries? It's actually a kind of complicated process, but the main thing is that Gustav Vasa, who was the king of Sweden, decided that uh, Lutheranism was a good, <laughs> good fit for his kingdom because it uh, meant that he could basically uh, incorporate the church into the state. And it made him very, very powerful in a, in a way that's really unheard of before in history. If you look at the Middle Ages, the king was powerful, but the church was a power unto itself. But in the Nordic countries and Sweden at first, we had uh, kind of just one he- hegemonic power, the church and state melted together. Uh, but the way it, it developed uh, with Lutheranism, that was a long process because uh, the people and the, the church was very much attached to their Catholic ways. And of course, there wasn't a clear concept of what a Lutheran church was. So it, it was a process that took several hundred years before a distinctly Lutheran church developed. Okay, so it was really more of a, a top-down process. It was a king's decision. Very much so, and it wasn't popular among the populace. So heading uh, into the 19th century, what changes with Lutheranism? The kind of official church is very much closely connected still to the state, uh, but there are strong religious uh, revival movements happening, and this creates a tension in the, in the Nordic countries uh, between these popular movements uh, that um, kind of have a democratic uh, idea that ordinary people can read the Bible and decide for themselves. This is not very popular among the powerful, so it gets basically banned. It's outlawed to gather and uh, read your Bible at home. (laughs) But these revival movements kind of create diversity, and and towards the end of the 19th century, some of them break off into so-called free churches, separate churches. Uh, Heading into the start of the 20th century, so the period we're really looking at, is the Lutheran faith still very powerful? Yeah, 
in a sense, uh, but this is also the time when uh, the churches start to lose their power. In, in all the Nordic countries, the like social democratic parties are, are very strong. They have, of course, like most socialists at this time, a kind of anti-religious agenda. There is kind of a, a struggle between the churches and, and the, the labor movement. And the church has kind of become part of the right wing of the political landscape. So during the 20th century, th- these countries really go from like completely uh, religious societies where everybody has to go to church because it's mandated by law to the most secular societies in the world. But of course, um, Christian ideas and Lutheran ideas still kind of um, have big uh, influence in, in society, but not in a very conscious way. People are maybe not aware of it. Uh, we're talking about horror movies, so we're talking about movies that touch on ideas of evil. Is there a Lutheran conception of evil significantly different from maybe a Catholic conception of evil? In the Lutheran world, one could say that the spiritual world is is more sparsely populated. <laughs> In the Catholic world, you have the saints and you have there's a lot of activity going on there, but the kind of Lutheran spiritual universe, there's God and there's Christ and the way uh, evil and things like this work is much more more subdued. But of course, in the popular religion, like the official Lutheran faith gets mixed up with like uh, old folk ideas. And, and of course, Catholic ideas that still remain active, it's very hard to distinguish what would come from, from the Lutheran religion and, and what is just part of kind of um, the folklore of the Nordic countries. In some of the movies we talk about, often they're set in medieval settings or early modern settings. And also the wilderness, these shots of you know harsh winds blowing over frozen lakes and valleys. But I think that's something that's very strong in kind of Lutheran part of the world, is that medieval times were often understood as, as basically evil times because they were Catholic. <laughs> then the notion of nature is, is interesting in, in itself, because um, I think... For, up until modern times, uh, nature was considered dangerous and, and the place of, of evil. Then at some point in the middle of the 20th century, this kind of got turned around and, and nature became kind of the place where people in Nordic countries go to have kind of a spiritual experience that is more or less completely distinct or separated from a church spirituality. But that's kind of something that happens during the 20th century. And, and I can imagine that this movement kind of gets mythologized in, in different ways. This idea of a rational and like clear-headed view, that's very strong in the Nordic countries and, and the kind of notion that there is this superstitious strains among the people that needs to be educated away. I think that has something that has really kind of um, been a strong current of thought and still is. And of course, when you have that idea, there's always this undercurrent of this irrational, dangerous ideas that come up to the surface. This means that the kind of religion plays a double role. Religion becomes something that is suspect because it doesn't fit into the rational. But then Lutheranism tries to be super rational. So there's all these kinds of conflicts going on. So um, we're going to start bringing... uh our first Dane into the fold. We're going to bring up a movie by uh, Carl Theodor Dreyer, or as he's often written, Carl Th- Dreyer. <laughs> um, Dreyer was uh, born in Copenhagen, 1889, the illegitimate child of a Swedish maid and a Danish farmer. He spent a few years in an orphanage before being adopted by a stern, God-fearing typographer. <laughs> Dreyer first worked as a journalist, then started writing title cards for silent films and eventually worked his way up to screenplays, hired by Denmark's Nordisk Film, one of the world's first cinema studios in 1913, and became a director. So Dreyer was a huge admirer of the Swedish movies that are being made at this time. He was actually really critical of the Danish movies that are being made. He thought they were churning out cheap pablum that didn't merit comparison to what the Swedes were doing. And he was given the opportunity to try to correct this when he became a director himself. And his Danish productions were notable for the intensity he brought to them, He insisted on heavily researched realism and rich detail, though the movies themselves were only mildly successful. And after the movie we talked about, that's when his career really took off because it really took off abroad, not in Denmark, when he started making movies in Germany and in France. Unlike the other three filmmakers we're going to be talking about, Dreyer never went to Hollywood. Despite that, he probably became uh, more of a renowned filmmaker than any of them today, at least in the eyes of cinephiles, I guess. 
But really that started because he made The Passion of Joan of Arc, which was sensational at the time and remains sensational today. Uh, you know, a movie that made in heavy use of intense emotional close-ups. And that was really electrifying for cinephiles across the world, really. Well, after that, then he moved on to talkies and his talkies became very celebrated. So we're going to be circling back to 1920 when he made a movie that's known as Leaves from Satan's Book. The only actual Danish production in our list of movies here. Uh, This was loosely, very loosely inspired by a book that was not written by Satan, a book by Mary Corelli (laughs) called The Sorrows of Satan. Uh, The Sorrows of Satan was actually a really popular book at the time. Murnau, F.W. Murnau, made a movie loosely inspired by The Sorrows of Satan right before Dreyer did. And D.W. Griffiths made a more faithful version of The Sorrows of Satan later. So it's kind of impressive that this book inspired movies by Murnau, Dreyer, and Griffiths. By Mary Corelli. Even though she's pretty forgotten today, her books were super popular at the time. Her books sold better than books by like Arthur Conan Doyle and Rudyard Kipling, who were wow. contemporaries of hers at, uh, at the time, an English writer. Very loosely based on it, though. So it's kind of like an anthology movie, right? We've got four stories. And the one connecting thread is that Satan's there, <laughs> playing a different role <laughs> in each episode. My boy. <laughs> <laughs> My boy, Satan. Showing a whole variety of costumes. Mm-hmm. Some interesting hairstyles. Which sounds like fun. But this Satan is having no fun whatsoever. No. This is not a fun-loving Satan. This is a very mopey Satan. So, like, we're introduced to the idea at the start that this is a weird uh, conception of Satan that I've never heard of before, that God has created a punishment for Satan where he orders him to go around committing evil deeds, which Satan really doesn't want to do, but God is ordering him to do this. And he gets time taken off from his punishment if people resist. I think he gets a thousand years taken off if somebody resists his temptation. Yeah. Yeah. But he's being ordered to tempt people. So God's saying, you have to do this job you hate, but if you're bad at it, you won't have to do it for as long. Yeah, it was such a strange (laughs) thing about how he was being goaded. Like every single one ended with, like he was just grieving and he's like, oh no, (laughs) because he wants to return to the, in good favor. Even if, when he started expressing like, oh you know, damn it. And I'm allowed to say that because I'm Satan. Damn it. I like that really <laughs> did not pan out. And it's like, and then God's voice arose, you know, continue to do your evil deeds. And it was just like being goaded along. He's really good at tempting people actually. But then once they start falling for the temptation, he's like, ah, oh, fuck no, don't. Oh, yeah, God damn it. Did it again. Why am I too good at this? Although it definitely like the seams start to show as the stories go along where he, is getting outright angry, like especially by the time we get to the um, the French revolutionaries. And he just outright says, like, you're Judas and I'm Satan. That's what the deal is, pal. Like, he just has this <laughs> rant. And he, like, almost verbatim says that. He's like, you want to know what the situation really is? Guess what? You're in a long line of Judases, and I'm the one and only Satan. So, pff, yeah, fuck up. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Now I got a mill around here for even longer looking at people in your stupid hats. Look at you. God damn it. And I can (laughs) say that because I'm Satan. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely a very strange play on the like the Satan character. Because I know in like really old Jewish texts, old Satan was um, the antagonist, right? So like his job was to tempt people to betray god and so i think this play on it being like a sentence is very strange but makes a lot of sense because i feel like no angelic presence would want to play the bad guy you're right he's lucifer he is an angel and i guess for transgressing god he becomes his pawn he just gets pushed around to buy him and in this strange petty goading (laughs) pretty much All of the Inquisitions and all of humanity, really, is just collateral damage. In a lot of these, it's not just that a certain individual has fallen. This is the spurring of wars, the falling of societies, the falling of countries. And Satan's just kind of kicking the dust going, ah, darn it. (laughs) (laughs) Did I do that? Oh, my God. And I can quote that because I'm Satan. (laughs) (laughs) Ah. Honestly, Satan was definitely the high point of this film for me. 
thought I thought mm. the guy did a great job. He was really he good. He had a cool pointy haircut the entire time. Oh yeah, the Bella Lugosi look in one of them. That was yeah. That was great. Helga Nilsson is the name of the actor who played Satan. He gets some good close ups and does some good work with them, has some good glowering. <laughs> uh, just got to provide an overview since to somebody who hasn't seen the movie it probably sounds like what the fuck are they talking about there are four segments one which is the story of judas betraying jesus the next it takes place in the spanish inquisition and then there's the french revolution and then we have the finnish civil war which was current events at the time the movie came out mm-hmm. kind of too bad that dreyer's sympathies are are uh, on the wrong side in both the french revolution and the finnish civil war but whatever that's fine i guess <laughs> uh, that was very clear. I was very confused by that. I'm like, take her head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much of that is Dreyer himself and how much of it is the industry that he was working in because he wasn't really an auteur yet at this point uh, with total control of his own movies. But Dreyer was a very conservative guy and the movie's perspective of the way it re- chooses to represent both the French Revolution and the Finnish Civil War is a pretty conservative perspective. Because also, this whole thing was definitely of the four films the driest. There was a lot of dry yeah. patches in this one. Like, it's still, yes. still good, but oh boy, there were some moments where it's like, you know what? We could have had three less scenes in each of these. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, of the four vignettes, the one that I liked the best was the Inquisition one. I like the way the young priest sublimates his uh, self abuse into into power mm. over others, and I think that's the one that best expressed what seemed to be kind of a thesis that's like evil is when we convince ourselves that we're allowed to act on impulses instead of required to deny them. Because like the last three all seem to have some variation of like a young guy who desires a woman and knows that he has to just kind of suffer in silence and then satan's like well actually you could become really powerful and then you can do whatever you want you know they all have some kind of version of that but i think it was best expressed uh, emotionally with like the self-flagellating priest for sure that one had a lot of power behind it and that's the one that started making me think of um i don't know if you've seen it in the 1970 german film mark of the devil oh no i've never yes. seen that hexen yes. bis auf blut gehalt which is translates to witches tortured till they bleed. Oh, uh, sorry. I thought you had like a chicken bone in your throat or something. Well, <laughs> that's German. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> throat and bone. And this, uh, <laughs> that's a movie that really haunts me still. Udo Kier in absolutely nice. devastatingly piercing eyed, handsome form. 1970. Okay. Um, now I'm sold. Yeah. Just, oh, just, so you good. could just watch Udo's eyes and you're like, woof, what a movie. And you got Herbert Lom as this venomous, grotesque, uh, sick-minded, like opportunistic person. It's in the 18th century and it's witch trials and that temptation to power. This feels like a bit of like the missing origin story of people just like this character in Mark of the Devil. Like in Leaves, we get it from Satan himself saying, look, why just torture yourself? There's opportunities here. You know, we're living in a really fucked up world right now. You can do fucked up things, too, if you roll with it in the right way. And that made me think of how horrible and demonic, really, someone can be Mm -hmm. by using Christianity as a weapon. Like so many things like that has to do with either the Inquisition or witch trials. You can't help but see the weaponization of Christianity used to like destroy people who you either didn't understand or disobeyed you. And I definitely think that the most interesting thing that I got from the movie was that kind of connection between desire and power and permission and what we permit ourselves to do. If you compare this to what he did with Joan of Arc later, you know, it's a totally different animal. The intensity of what he builds with close-ups in Joan of Arc, we're nowhere near that at this point. So Dreyer is not fully flexing his muscles yet, I think, uh, in terms of what he would develop in his craft. You know, Dreyer is not always the most approachable filmmaker. That's part of his reputation. And I think that's a lot of people's experience with Dreyer is that you really have to put in the work to get into his movies. I thought it was very well shot and I thought it was very pretty to look at as I'm somebody who likes Inquisition aesthetics and stuff like that. I just, I'm a big fan of like 70s witch movies. So the Inquisition sequence was again, very much my favorite I definitely love yeah. a good flagellation scene. <laughs> Big fan. 
<laughs> Every movie needs one. But that's just for my own sick needs. Just like Satan. My boy. <laughs> You haven't seen it and enjoy the video Rosenrot by Rammstein. Lots of uh, ah. yeah, whipping whipping a backs there. <laughs> Comparable movies actually since you mentioned Mark of the Devil, mm-hmm. to a lesser extent, I definitely see like Witchfinder General being like this almost taken mm. to the extreme oh, yeah. of like abusive religious zealotry. All right, so let's get uh, introduced to uh, our second Dane of the evening. Benjamin Christensen, who was born in Viborg, Denmark in 1879, the youngest of 12 children in a bourgeois family. Uh, he first studied medicine, and then he trained as an opera singer before an illness caused him to lose his voice, and he began acting. Once in the young world of Danish cinema, he found his way to the director's chair, and his first film was The Mysterious X. Great title. Kind of a spy thriller from 1914, which has some pretty cool and inventive camera work and cuts. And with the mysterious X, he gained a reputation as an innovative maverick, but was also a a headache for producers. That movie ended up costing four times its initial budget. Christensen had assumed control of his own studio in Helborg, but it was soon sliding into bankruptcy. So Christensen was in Berlin one day in 1918, and he wandered into a bookstore and discovered an old copy of something called Malleus Maleficarum. This is a treatise on witchcraft, first published in Germany in 1486 by a Catholic clergyman named Heinrich Kreimer. It was condemned by the Inquisition, but it had been used by royal courts during the Renaissance and had contributed to brutal punishments against witchcraft in the 16th and 17th centuries. Christensen bought this book and became obsessed. From 1918 to 1921, he devoted himself to studying everything he could get his hands on about the bizarre history of European witchcraft and witch hunting. So the film that Christensen imagined himself making about his new obsession would require a massive budget. And incredibly, he got it. It was Sweden's Svenska Bio. You know, the same studio we we're talking about earlier. They stepped in, they purchased Christensen's Helberg studio out of bankruptcy, refurbished it, and basically gave Christensen near total control over this pet project of his. And Svenska Bio would end up providing the biggest budget that any Scandinavian silent movie ever had. Finally, in 1922, after working on the project for years, Hexan was released. After Hexen, Christensen briefly worked in Germany, uh, and he too was poached by Louis B. Meyer to work in Hollywood to join the stable of talented Europeans or immigrant labor, depending on your perspective, making films for MGM at that time. Apparently, when Meyer was screened a copy of Hexen, he asked somebody, is this man crazy or a genius? <laughs> and Christensen did make a couple movies with MGM. Uh, He also struggled with his producers there. And then he signed with First National Pictures and made some horror films before returning to Denmark. And uh, one of his movies in Denmark, A Talkie, was a big flop. And he decided to retire from filmmaking and lived out the rest of his life managing a movie theater in Copenhagen. So let's get back to the film that he is best known for in the climax of our evening. Hexen, 1922, also known as Witchcraft Through the Ages. And no one is that because that was the title given to a version that was released in 1968, uh, which was heavily edited and had a jazz score and had <laughs> narration by William S. Burroughs. Hexen struggled a bit on its release, partially because censors didn't like the movie. Uh, it, it struggled with censorship in Germany and France and in America. There's a variety review of Hickson where the critic wrote, wonderful though this picture is, it is absolutely unfit for public exhibition. Uh, I like that. Uh, The surrealist liked it, as you could maybe imagine. But um, when this uh, Burroughs version came out in the 60s, it was experiencing a bit of a revival among the counterculture, but as kind of a midnight movie oddity. But uh, the actual movie, the fully restored movie, is so much more than just a surreal trip. As much as it works that way, too. Um, This was really kind of almost an academic treatise on Christensen's ideas about how we should interpret stories of witchcraft and tying them to Freudian ideas about hysteria. It's a pseudo-documentary. It's recreation. 
It's dispelling myths while also really, really reveling in myths. It's a totally strange, unclassifiable movie. And it's a fucking blast. Yeah. And just great visuals. It sort of initially presents itself almost like an academic lecture. But with Almost the... farcically academic. You know, you've got plates, figures, dioramas, a pointer coming into frame. <laughs> yeah, the first time I saw this, I can still recall just being mesmerized and kind of confounded by the academic lecture with the, just the most rad diagrams ever made <laughs> yeah. of just the, what is the core of the earth? Oh, here's a two-dimensional puppet version of hell that is interactive like a goddamn pop-up book. And... Yeah. And quite literally a goddamned puppet book how despite having this insane revelry and all these things it still has this weird clinical version of its dramatizing nothing like this has happened before and and since like what yeah. what other movie is like this and with this much talent and earnestness <laughs> put into it and i love that contrast when people first went to the movie, when it was first released, they were giving a playbill that was a bibliography that had sources in it. So it was very much presented. You know, the <laughs> framing was, this is a lecture. And the contrast between the dry way he sets it up, very, very incredibly fun and full of great images, as you said, but intentionally dry. And the ribald recreations that are so zany and fun and lovingly made and uh, sometimes absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. There are moments mm -hmm. of shocking beauty. Uh, some of the silhouette shots, you know, we have the spectral witches flying in the background and the foreground has a, a woman silhouetted against branches and stuff. Some of this is very, very beautifully created. And some of it is just very fun. The witch parties seem like a fucking blast, you know, <laughs> yes. getting devil's names, just dancing all night, eating babies, enchanting a cow at the end of the evening. <laughs> you know, I want to be there. This is what COVID took from us. <laughs> and yeah. Studio 54 <laughs> dreams of being this wild. He presents the movie like it's going to be a debunker. But he, his explanations that are very unconvincing and are pushed to the side, well, he puts so much compelling power into his case that there's something actually uh, magical and incredible about this idea of witches using the magic of cinema that it almost functions more like a rebunker. He's breathing life into these ideas. He's, he's not squashing them at all. He's inflating them. <laughs> and I love that <laughs> dynamic. And the faithfulness that he puts, especially into his like witchcraft reproductions is so thorough. It's, mm -hmm. it's the margins on medieval manuscripts. Yeah. Like all the little devils that are, they're modeled after that kissing the devils behind alternating <laughs> cheeks. I don't know if you guys caught that, <laughs> but yeah, they, they alternate cheeks. So I was starting to realize there's so much depth to this movie. There's so much going on. I needed to call in a real expert. Okay, so I'm talking with uh, Dr. Richard Backstrom, who's Professor of Anthropology and the Humanities at the University of Edinburgh. Richard, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Dylan. So you wrote with Todd Myers uh, a book about Hexand called Realizing the Witch, which is a really fascinating book. I absolutely loved it. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about uh, how you see this movie. About how I see the film? Well, that's... That'll take quite a bit of time, but uh, I'll, tr <laughs> I'll try to summarize. And Hexen is really, I mean, it's a lot of different things. So it's a very innovative film for anyone interested in the history of film because it's quite innovative in terms of its technique, its mode of storytelling. But I think even more importantly, certainly for Todd, my co-author and myself, we were really fascinated by the claim that Benjamin Christensen makes for the film, which is that this is a truthful you know, representation of who the witch was and who the witch is, at least in 1922, when the film is eventually released. And given how completely haywire some aspects of the film are, and it, it is quite terrifying if you take it seriously and watch carefully, mm -hmm. but it, as a film, it, it is really quite extreme. It takes a really extreme position on its subject, which is not only the witch, but also Satan and the devil, and really the way in which 
dealing with uh, a figure like the witch moves from being a concern of religious institutions to those of scientific institutions or things like medicine. But it does so in such a way that you not only learn facts about the history of the witch in the West over time, but you start to feel, you start to get a real affective sense of what it not only meant to be confronted with a figure that you believe to be a witch or a hysteric, if you're talking about a later period, but you also get the sense of what it means to be confronted with the accusation of being a witch, of being cast out, of being the focus of these very violent powers seeking to eject you from the social. Cinema has a particular facility in doing that. It's a film that grabs you and doesn't let you go. Oh, totally. I absolutely agree. It's completely uh, engrossing to watch. Yeah, it is funny how the way it presents itself right off the bat as kind of dryly academic, but his chosen subject really seems to reject that treatment. So what's going on with that? Why do you think this idea of witchcraft seems to resist being tamed by a movie ostensibly built to be a demystification of silly old ideas? Yeah, I think much of that comes from the fact that witchcraft itself, it's a very big problem for the church because its it, you can't recuperate the evil conspiracy that the witch represents into a kind of good Christian world that God has created for us, even if it has sin and it has all sorts of problems. Um, it's a problem for science because the phenomenon of the witch it exceeds reason in a way, right? I mean, you can try to explain it away with facts, with scientific studies, but even today, it still exceeds any sort of scientific knowledge about it, right? It still persists, and there's still an aspect of it that is just completely inexplicable. And that, to me, is the key to the film. So in a certain sense, Benjamin Christensen allows this degeneration to happen because by the end of the film, he's kind of lost control of of his message a little bit. But he has a certain courage to let this happen. So this, this plagues the social sciences or anthropology, which is my home discipline. You know, we consistently research phenomenon around witchcraft, possession, magic, and so on. And we do our very best, and quite often in a very skilled way, we return some work, mostly written work, that tries to explain and give some sort of reasonable explanation for this phenomenon in human life but we never achieve it. We just never do. There's something that exceeds this. And this this is a problem. This is a problem for a scientific discipline that purports to be able to grasp the world transparently, objectively, and logically. So there's a certain kind of paradox in taking up research or representations related to something like witchcraft or the witch, which I think is more precise in, in relation to Hexen. We'll never stop researching it and and commenting on it and trying to represent it, and we'll never achieve that. And I don't mean that pessimistically. I just mean that that is intrinsic to the phenomenon. So in your book, you write about the idea of being caught by the witch. What does that mean? What are you referring to when you talk about being caught? It's the experience that even Todd, my co-author, and I had when we first saw this film for the first time, and we thought, ah, you know, a campy old horror film, you know, from the first frames when Benjamin Christensen is kind of staring out at you, it's Christensen who actually catches you. And then he just draws you further and further into it. You can't take an objective position in a way. His mode of operating in the film mimics the mode of operation that the witch supposedly possesses for him or herself. He operationalizes what he's in theory also kind of demonstrating or trying to illuminate our knowledge of. Actually, towards the end of the film, the mode of engagement shifts from engaging with witchcraft to engaging with possession, right? So the the possession of the nuns uh, that comes in the sixth chapter of the film, which is also just incredibly striking and still involves the connection to Satan. And there's a lot of continuity, but it's actually shifted a little bit. And I think it's to illustrate this power of capture, which for someone trying to look at this film from an objective point of view, trying to recuperate it to something like reason or sensibility, uh, this is really highly problematic, but this is precisely the point as well. So, you know, I can't explain why we wrote this book except to say that we were captured by the film. And it connected with other experiences we'd had as anthropologists. So we wrote about what happened to us in a weird sort of way. Yeah, I find it really fascinating how kind of uh, radically at ease he seems to be with not setting up these firm boundaries between this is truth, this is bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. I think some of the conventions that we take for granted now between what is acceptable in a 
say, a nonfiction film and what is not, although some of these conventions are now breaking down a little bit more, but that line that hadn't been drawn yet, I would argue. And I think some of that convention of what counts as documentary and what doesn't starts to be drawn in response to a film like Hexen or a film like Nanook of the North, also coming out in 1922. Nanook is largely criticized nowadays because it's heavily reenacted. This also was highly problematic for later documentarians, even as early as John Grierson, who coined the term documentary itself. They felt it didn't live up to its claim to being a truthful document and started drawing precisely those lines. But the reality of what is being depicted constantly eludes the lines we try to draw around it. You know, underneath our motivation for writing the book was, I wouldn't exactly call it a criticism of our own discipline, but a kind of a gut check in a sense of coming back to the limits of what we do and the history of our discipline in relation to trying to domesticate what we've called nonsense or these excessive elements of human life that just simply cannot be objectified and completely captured in the form of a kind of infinitely reproducible fact. Hexen allowed us to do that in a way. It's a little weird to, for anthropologists to sit and write a forensic account of a single film, let alone a 1920 Scandinavian witchcraft film. But it was really liberating. And I think Hexen has that effect for a lot of viewers, even if it's not the same liberation. Time and again, people come up to me at screenings of the film or when I've talked about the book in other venues, and they just talk about the weird effect that it has about how they could think differently or how they did something differently. It has a different sort of power, I think, if you really pay attention to it. And like I said, I mean, the very personal reasons of just exercising a demon or trying to escape that capture that had happened to us, that was part of it too. And that's that's an unusual reason to write an academic book. I mean, that's not something you put on your CV. I did this to exercise a demon. But that's what we did. I don't know. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to actually have such a, an intense engagement with such a brilliant piece of work. We know who was playing the devil don't we? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He did. <laughs> yeah. That's Benji. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and the first thing we see in the movie is Benjamin Christensen's face mm-hmm. glowering seriously at us. Yeah. Being like, this is me. Welcome to my TED Talk. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like, I am going to mesmerize you. So that it's so fitting that he shows up as the devil mesmerizing people <laughs> and being like, by the way, tricked you. I'm the devil all along. <laughs> you know, I'm getting you on board with witchcraft, actually. <laughs> Tongue wagging all the while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's very lewd. Yeah, churning butter or something. <laughs> A yeah. lot of butter churning metaphors, which is not Vigorous subtle. butter churning. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Apollonie's dream sequence is, is something that I love so much. The possession in the nunnery near the end. Just little cutaways, like when the the witches turn themselves into cat people so that they can, like, defecate on the altar or whatever, and there's pink (laughs) people guarding the door. You know, this is, like, just a a brief little shot, but it's such a wonderful brief little shot. (laughs) People in fursona costumes for those scenes. I thought they were going to use animals when he was describing it ahead of time, but no. Way better that way. And certainly, and it's, it is worth noting for sure, like as much as it's so fun, there is definitely really well crafted moments of horror imagery, like the nun hypnotically moving around with a knife, the seeing the lives ruined from it, like those that don't party, those that are being corrupted and die or suffer from it were very successfully done horror bits. Like I felt the dread. There are moments here that are going to cut the fun and get to some really awful feelings. Yeah. And that's important to bring out too, because it could be fun to just fucking smoke a joint and sit back and watch all this zany imagery. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fun to do, but there's so much more to it than that. And there are, like you mentioned, there are moments of horror and there are moments of humanity that really deepen the experience of what you're watching. Uh, I like the Inquisition members and the way that when she starts telling a silly story about witchcraft, we have these close-ups of them laughing hideously. And then when she starts like going further into it and then begins naming names, suddenly we see them all very seriously taking notes. 
that's kind of the way you watch the movie. You know, you start off like, oh, look at this silly bullshit. And then by the end, you're like, oh, shit, you know, I, I'm paying very close attention to what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. It, just that wonderful balance of just encouraging us to have that kind of relish and the, the puerile, giddy, leering quality that these monks have. Like these monks clearly fucking love leering at these, these forbidden delights the way that you react to the material you're seeing is also folded into what the movie's talking about and its message of how these stories took off and, uh, and how they ultimately ended up infecting a lot of lives. All right, well, let's, uh, let's wrap things up here, shall we? Okay. I mean, we didn't really have a gimmick to tie these movies together, but if you were to recommend one to somebody who doesn't know any of them, who doesn't really watch many silent movies, uh, which fair, Uh, Let's start with you, Nick. Which one of these four would you recommend first? Uh, I would definitely start with Hexen. Mm -hmm. But if some of these more into a more classical or emotionally tied film, I would definitely have to say The Phantom Carriage. Yeah, that makes sense to me. They're the two strongest films, absolutely. For prose sake and emotional reaction, then The Phantom Carriage takes the cake. But for everything that Hexen offers you you can't deny that it will be such a memorable experience you know if you ask me what's my favorite silent horror movie i would not hesitate i'd say the phantom carriage uh, it's a movie that i love and it's probably among my favorites um i will say Hexen was way more of a contender than i expected it to be because i'd seen it before but it'd been a few years and revisiting it was an incredible experience and now i can't wait to revisit it again but man, it's a it's a fun world to uh, dunk your head into and get to know. As with any body of silent film, we just have to work with the survivors. There are some remarkable survivors. It's a it's a fascinating world. Uh, Nick, thanks a lot for coming back. It's been a while. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's have you back again soon. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Will, as always, thank you. Oh, no need to thank ever. It's been a little bit of a while since we did our season premiere. Sorry about that. Uh, maybe it'll be a little bit less longer till the next one. We'll see, but we're working on something that's going to be really fun. <laughs> so I look forward to serving that up to you guys as well. Uh, thanks for listening. As always, thank you for subscribing. Really appreciate it. Have a good night. Keep looking behind you. Stay warm. Stay out of the cold. <laughs> I feel after talking about these movies, I feel like I'm going to open my curtains and it's just going to be driving snow everywhere. (laughs) I I don't believe that it's... Yeah, turn on the heat. Everybody turn on your furnace just so Scandinavia can't get in. (laughs) That's the real horror. (laughs) Scandinavia is lurking around every corner. (laughs) Exactly. Nån som talar ingen alls har på Människor stannar tills det vågar på Någon skriver ord Som aldrig blir till sång Någon går It's not all cold and bleak, kids. Give it a go. <laughs> Are you sure about that? It's mostly cold and bleak. Well, Satan is the Lord of Lies, so you gotta end on a lie. (laughs) It's bleak as shit. Just, yeah. Keep your chin up, kids.